All right. Thank you. I see most of you have come back. Thanks very much for that. So we've got two speakers left for the day. Um, the first one is Sonia Blotno, who is somebody who speaks at many of our conferences. It really, really, uh, I think you're going to find her talk very, very inspiring as well. She's talking about complexity. Um, and it's obviously, you know, quite often we, we don't realize how much complexity we actually are dealing with. Um, so I'm really happy to welcome Sonia to the stage. And um, yeah, I think you're really going to enjoy her talk. Hello. I don't think my theme song came through so well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you'll see why just now. You'll be method in my madness. I think I should applaud you for staying um, on such a cold day with the traffic building up out there for a talk about complexity of all things. Um, so maybe a little bit about me that you don't know. Um, I think one of the more interesting things about me potentially, I am a meteorologist by training. Never made it to TV. This is the closest I get. <laughs> but um, people always ask me, so how did you get from the weather to what you're doing now? Because mostly nowadays, I work with people and you know, to help them kind of better deal with uncertainty. And then I normally ask, well, let me ask you guys, how many of you work with or manage people? <laughs> Besides what's going on out there at the moment, which is very unexpected, what do you think is more unpredictable, the weather or people? Uh, so can you make, you can see how I ended up where I am. So normally when people hear, you know, there's a talk about complexity, I get this response. Um, I think I'm one of the only people, not only, but one of the few people in the world who are actually and is excited by complexity. And I get a bit frustrated. You know, you, I think some of these acronyms have come up already today. Things like VUCA. You know, we live in a VUCA world. There's a new one now, Barney. Have you come across Barney? Are they at all inviting to you? Not at all, hey? It feels like something consultants use to scare you into using their services. You know, if the world is brittle, anxious and I can never remember the end and it's you know I, I just don't feel drawn to that world and it frustrates me because complexity is beautiful and I'm hoping that today I'm going to convince you of that and maybe just change how you see it your relationship with it because I don't know if if you've noticed you know there's been a lot of wonderful talks and wonderful frameworks and strategy tools, et cetera, et cetera, and very little of that. I think one of the speakers mentioned it. It's not brand new. Some of these things have been around. And yet, we still fall back into doing things the same old way. And I'm really curious about why that is. And I think part of it is because of the stories we're telling ourselves about complexity and about change and about ambiguity and discomfort. So that's what we were going into today a little bit. So to clarify terms, I guess, when I talk about complexity, it's an interesting word. We all think we know what it means, but not necessarily so. So in our normal vernacular, we tend to um, use complex and complicated interchangeably. So we use complex. So if something is really difficult, it's got many moving parts. We like, you know, it's like a higher order difficulty. We say it's complex. So in my, in my language, that would be complicated. Complicated, the word plick means enfolded. I can unfold it. I can fully understand it. I can become an expert in it. I can replicate it. I can teach other people to be experts in it. It's figure outable. Complexity, plex, means tangled or braided together. 
And so many of the talks today already have, have mentioned the importance of relationships and interconnectedness. I really love the talk on Ubuntu. But the more interconnected we become, the more complexity. I don't know how many of you have tried to untangle women. You will know what I'm talking about. You know when your chains get tangled? The more is in there, the, more, the harder it gets. And the worst thing you can do is to start pulling at it. And that is what we do in organizational contexts when we face complexity. We almost harden against it. So that's the one thing is understanding that complexity in my, in my world means entanglement, lots of di diversity, emergence. So it, it basically comes with, the, the uncertainty comes with the territory. You can't have complexity and not have some level of uncertainty. So VUCA, I think the volata volatility, uncertainty, and ambiguity comes from the sea, from the complexity. And the world is becoming more complex because we're becoming more interconnected. And so the second term I just wanted to touch on is this notion of fitness. So I'm talking about complexity fitness. Normally when you hear that word, it conjures up that image on the, on the left. And there's an aspect of that that is true. Because I don't know if you've noticed, how many of you find that you are super tired? Actually, you would say you're depleted. How many of you are? For the first time ever, my clients are not saying, oh, I can't wait for the end of the year. I just want December to come. They're saying, it feels like December is coming at me. Can we just kind of, this, you know, I'm, I'm too busy. I can't, do, I can't deal with it now. And part of it is because being in perpetual uncertainty and perpetual complexity is tiring. It takes more out of us. We have to work harder. And so we have to look after our physical bodies. We have to sleep. You know, we have to eat well. You know, but I don't want to get into that side of things because it can very easily feel as if you're being preached at. When I use the word fitness, it's more like an ecological term. And it's the ability to be at ease in a particular context. So the way that a leopard is at ease in an ecological niche. Now that, that leopard isn't stressing. <laughs> the same way, can we be at ease in discomfort, in continuous change, in complexity? So when I talk about becoming complexity fit, that is what I'm referring to. So I'm not going to ask you to, to chat to anybody close to you, but I do want just to get your opinion. Um, I'm going to show you two images. And basically what I want to know is which one makes you feel more comfortable. Okay? Are you ready? Okay, cool. First one. Got it? Second one. <laughs> which one makes you feel more comfortable? So the one on the left. Who feels more comfortable with the one on the left? One on the right. Which one makes more sense? The one on the right. And it's so interesting because, you know, this one on the left, you know when it makes sense? Maybe. Early in the morning. You know, just after that sandpit's been cleaned. Or if it's like a shop where you're buying the toys. But in any other instance, it really does not make sense. Somebody said to me the other day, that little boy in the beginning with the face, that's him sitting there. <laughs> but the thing is, this makes us feel more comfortable. You know, I, I've worked with teams of actuaries. They all go there. <laughs> and it's not that there's anything wrong with that world. You know, we kind of, we stand with one foot in each of these worlds, you know. So, you know, this would be, I guess, the world of order. But this, this one here, that is, that's life, that is complexity. This one feels like we can exert some kind of control. Okay? It, it's clear, it's not too messy. We feel like we can have some control there, although it doesn't really make sense. Over here, it's alive. Would you agree? It's alive with possibility, but I don't know how much control we have over there. And I think this is the dilemma. Because what we've done over the last few decades is we've set up our structures to look like that. 
because it makes us more comfortable. It gives us some certainty, it gives us clarity, and it gives us a sense of control. But now what we find is, now we need to be adapting to an external context that looks like this. And now those structures have kind of started becoming too constraining for us. What this has done, amongst other things, is it's created an adversarial relationship with complexity. So it's really interesting for me, um, I always say to people, I've been working in the field of complexity since before it became cool. Because it's interesting, I, um, I first started working in, in complexity in about 2002, and then it was really difficult to find any literature about it, except if you looked in scientific journals. The Harvard Business Review, those kinds of, of magazines, they weren't really writing about it. And then, I guess with the rise of VUCA, which isn't really all that new, it comes from the 80s, um, from the, I think it was the, the US military who coined the phrase to describe the post-Cold War, con War context. But it became fashionable because I think it became our lived experience. But ever since then, you started seeing the word complexity more or less everywhere. But what I find amusing is, you know, and you can, you can go and look at this, when it's being written about, the verb that goes along with it is typically something like solve, simplify, tame, eliminate. You know, so we see it as a wicked challenge to act on. Something that we need to, you know, if we can't ignore it, we really just, you know, we need to get rid of it. That's kind of the, the way that we, we feel about it. Even when we say we need to make sense of the complexity, Sometimes it's a euphemism for, we just need to find another way to control it. And it comes from how we see the world and what we think about, or what we think is normal. So I don't know about you, but many of us, I, for a long time, you know, it's, we've been taught that things need to be stable and predictable and certain, and that's normal. And when they become unstable or unpredictable, or they become messy, it's abnormal and it needs to go back to stability. And that's, you know, the, the kind of habit of mind. Um, I'm trying to unlearn the word mindset because I, <laughs> I um, spent some time with a, a neuroscientist at a conference in, in Portugal and she said to me, changing mindset is a euphemism because if your mind is set, it can't change. It's a habit of mind. So I'm trying to, to learn that myself. But what is the problem? You know, and, and when you, and again, you know, I'm highlighting language here because if we see this as a wicked challenge and we want to tame it and we want to simplify it, you know, and we live in a Barney world where things are brittle and anxious and all of these things, it puts us in a position where, as I say, you know, we, we see it, we're in an adversarial relationship with it. And there's a big problem with this, going back to my chains, what you resist persists. And this is, is something that, you know, I, I've changed the way that I think about complexity over the last year or two, because I know almost all of the frameworks out there, I still use them. But if we use any of these frameworks, and they're wonderful tools out there, with this habit of mind, with this way of looking at the world, that complexity is something we need to eliminate, we will keep kind of making our problems worse, even though we're using complexity tools. And so I believe that complexity is a context that we act in. And this is interesting because we're always in complexity, but not everything that we're busy with is complex. So they are very ordered systems around. You know, so if you think, for example, about an operating theater, I really want my team of surgeons to have a checklist, to count the instruments as it goes in and it comes out again, to make sure they left nothing behind. I want them to be very sure what side of my body they're supposed to be operating on. The same goes for a, a, you know, an air, airplane cockpit. You know, I really want there to be you know, not too much complexity. But even in the most ordered system, so if you think, for example, about a car, you know, a car is an ordered system, it's complicated. 
the moment a human being gets behind the wheel, we have introduced complexity into that ordered system. And when you drive it on the road, it's operating in a broader complex system. So not everything is complex, but you know we're kind of always in complexity. And complexity has become a bit of a thing. You know, it's almost like we see it as this thing outside of us, again, that we need to resist. But in almost every sentence that you can use the word complexity, you can substitute it with life. Because here's the thing, you all already know how to navigate complexity. So if you have elderly parents, for example, you know, I'm, I'm navigating a mother that is slowly deteriorating into dementia. It's very complex. Those of you who have children, if you have teenagers, the other day in one of my client workshops, I had a lady with triplets, 12 years old. I said, she can come and teach me about complexity. But if you parent, you understand how to navigate complexity. Just being at this conference, you're navigating complexity. All of the small talk, you know, running into people that maybe you haven't seen in a long time. You know, it's every single conversation you're in is complex. You don't know what the other person is going to say. It's continuously emerging. And so we're always in complexity. And I think this is, you know, one of the things that I truly believe is complexity is an invitation. It is not necessarily a huge challenge for us to solve. Yes, some of the challenges we face, especially as humanity, are very complex, almost to the point of being intractable. But that does not change the fact that complexity is beautiful. If you think about it, you go on holiday in complexity. Any living system, the Kruger Park, or the beach you go to, you know, wherever it is that's your thing, even you know, if you go to Sun City, or I don't know where you go on holiday, those are all complex systems. Our nervous systems relax when we're in nature. And so there's a beauty and complexity, and even in the midst of our most complex challenges, there's always opportunity because everything is connected. You know, one of the things I, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, because when everything is uncertain, anything is possible. Now, I, I think I'm one of the weird creatures that I really don't like that left hand image with the, the and then when I tell people you need to embrace messiness, you know, my husband sometimes, he says, you do too well at that. You're an overachiever at embracing messiness. Um, but I, I believe that there's life in the middle of the mess and in the complexity. And so this is an invitation. And I think with the rise of AI, and some of the speakers have already spoken about this, people always ask me, so what do I think is going to happen? And I don't know. But what I do know is there are some things that machines can't do. And this is, you know, the previous, one of the previous speakers touched on this, you know, empathy, creativity, imagination. Those are things that, you know, machines can't do. And so it's an invitation back into what I believe is that spirit of exploration. So a few weeks ago, I spoke at a conference in Lisbon. I don't know how many of you have been to Lisbon. So just outside Lisbon, there's um, a place called Belém with a very... Um, impressive monument to all the explorers um, you know, that many centuries ago left from Portugal. Um, some of them came here, people like Vasco da Gama. And I found myself standing there with you know, a bit of, a, you know, a bit of co cognitive dissonance, because on the one hand, you know, I, you know, and just imagine this. Imagine this is 400 years ago, and you're standing on a pier, about to board a ship, not very big, probably big in those year's standards, with, let's say, just enough water and food to last you, I don't know, three months. And you're heading off into the unknown with no idea where you're going, no idea if you're going to come back. Can you imagine that spirit of exploration that was alive in those times, in those people? Now, why I felt some dissonance is, you know, I know kind of what, the, what happened, you know, from a colonial perspective. You know, it's not necessarily always been positive. But that spirit of exploration 
is what I believe complexity is inviting us into. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, I think we need to learn to be ways finders, and I put that S in on purpose again. We are in uncharted territory. You know, people would say, we've been in a world before with pandemics and wars and, you know, all of these things, but we haven't been in a world before. We have all of those things along with climate collapse, along with intelligent machines. I don't know how many of you kind of had flashbacks to all of the movies that you've ever seen, you know, like Terminator, etc. when that AI said to its creator, I want to be free. It kind of, you know, the unintended consequences there that we haven't fully kind of figured out, but we haven't been in this kind of a world before. And so we need to shape a different relationship with discomfort. So we need to be more comfortable being uncomfortable. And there are three things. We need to reset how we, you know, the stories we tell ourselves, how we see the world. We need to reorient and find new ways of navigating. And then we need to respond. And you'll see I'm using resetting, reorienting, responding, because these are continuous processes. And to do that, and now the, um, the song will make sense, to reset, one of the first things we need to, to think about is to be cool. And um, I think there are, there are some uh, complexity academics probably turning in their graves, but I find people can remember this. And it's a stance, it's a way of showing up in the world. So these are habits of mind. And we all already have them, we've just forgotten. So COOL is a, an acronym, it stands for courage, openness, observing, and lightness. And so I'll go through them quickly. Firstly, courage. The courage to relax into flow and into what is. I think sometimes we, we deny what is <laughs> and we resist. Remember what you resist persists. If you do want to untangle those chains, when you relax into it and you just kind of start relaxing, that's when you can get them you know, untangled. When you pull at them, not so much. And so we need to acknowledge, allow, allow the complexity, let go, and dance. Donella Meadow says we dance with a complex system because it's always changing. The moment you look at a complex system, it's changed. So you need to get close to it. You need to dance with it. You need to be flexible. You know, people have already spoken about being adaptable. And where it links to wayfinding is, you know, one of my favorite anthropologists, Tim Ingold, he says, wayfinding isn't knowing before we go, it's knowing as we go. And how many of you have um, either been guilty of or been confronted with someone when you want to try something new and they say, how will I know it's going to work? So how can we step into this, into the courage to know as we go, to become like those explorers again and to just kind of go into the unknown without fear? Second one is openness. And this is openness to novelty, to difference and to discomfort. So here what we're looking at is question. Sometimes we really, really want to, to get to the answer. You know, we jump to solutions very quickly because it's uncomfortable to sit in the ambiguity of a question. But in complexity, questions remain. Answers are, you know, they, they don't necessarily last very long. I think it's David Cooper Ryder who, um, he created Appreciative Inquiry and he said, we live in the world our questions create. So can we be open to sit in questions for longer? Can we span boundaries of disciplines, of geographies, of silos? Can we work with people, have relationships with people who don't see the world like we see it? And this one I think is really important because nowadays we live in a world where if we can't agree, we can't have a relationship, um, which is very, we live in a polarized world. And then finally, openness to unlearn. Now, I think the half-life of information nowadays, I think I'm already behind. The last time I checked was like something like 12 months. So if you do a four-year degree, of halfway through, half of what you've learned is no longer relevant. <laughs> so can we unlearn or do we become stuck in our sense of expertise? And so here I like Bonita Roy who says ambiguity and incompleteness are synonymous with potential. So when things are uncertain, there's lots of potential. If everything is certain, 
not so much. Observing, and particularly are the patterns that keep us stuck. And so here it's about noticing, it's about pausing, maybe pause should have been before notice, I'm not sure, they kind of intertwine, and choose, choose differently. We tend to just react. We've got these knee-jerk reactions. You know, somebody said, mentioned, you know, when somebody cuts in in front of, tra in front of you in traffic, you know, it's, can you pause and choose your response or do you just go to your natural response? So observing has two aspects, situational awareness, so what's going on around me? And then what is going on inside of me? Why am I feeling triggered? Why do I feel like I want to go back to old ways of doing things? And then finally, all oh, this, no, this is that I forgot this quote. This is one of my favorite people is Esther Perel. I don't know how many of you follow her. She's a psychoanalyst. And I encountered this quote not too long ago, actually. She said, we have a form of assisted living surrounded by predictive technologies. Now, I'm guilty of this. I use ways even when I know when I'm going because I don't want to run into a traffic jam. I see I'm not the only one. But we have Netflix telling us what to watch. We have Spotify telling us what to listen to. We have ways telling us where to go. And so we are less and less in contact with our own choices. We don't make, you know, if, if, if now if a movie isn't great, I can blame Netflix. But it's making us less able to deal with uncertainty. And so the key thing here is, can we, can we just switch off the GPS every now and again? Can we allow ourselves to get lost? And then the last one, lightness. To find replenishment and to restore our humanity in the aliveness of complexity. And here it's about play. You know, we talk about playing with numbers. Do you use that language? Do you ever really play with the numbers? Do you just say that you play with it? Imagine laugh, marvel, rest. Rest nowadays has almost become countercultural. But you know, these things like play and imagination, we say that this is for children, mature adults, we don't do this. But if we want to be effective in the, in the future, we're going to have to you know, accept this invitation into our humanity. And so I like this one, the future is uncertain, but this uncertainty is at the very heart of human creativity. And so responding and, and orienting, I want to give you a very brief introduction to a framework. I have to give you some kind of a framework, but it's going to be very light touch. Because here's the thing is, when we want to experiment, when we're going into the unknown, if we don't have boundaries, it feels very unsafe. But if, we, if everything is, if somebody's telling us what to do, then we can't explore. So how do we find the middle ground? And this is around ways finding. And it's ways finding with an S because there's always more than one way in complexity. And it's about ways finding potential states. What potential is out there that we haven't seen yet? And so resetting, we already spoke about that, is practicing new habits of mind. Reorienting is to create a wayfinding field. It's almost to say, where do we want to explore? And some of this will sound familiar because of the, this strategy talk this morning. But the first is, to set direction or intent. Where are we going? Where do we want to go and why? And this is not the same as a goal. It's a sense of direction. But then what we need are boundaries. I don't know if you've seen with children, if you tell them, just go play and explore, and there's no boundaries, they stick, you know, they cling. But if there's a boundary, even if it's just a, you know, like a piece of, of um, string on the ground, they'll venture out. Have you seen that? We're the same. <laughs> so the first is, where can't we go? Where are our limits? You know, sometimes there's re re regulations. Sometimes it's geographical. It could be anything, but we just this, these are things we can't do anything about. We need to work within them. Then on the other side, we have, you know, we need to set containment. We need to put boundaries in place. Where do we choose not to go? You know, so maybe we are a we're a bank. We need to stay in financial services. We're not going to become a telecoms company. We're choosing that because otherwise our exploration field is too broad. But once you've set these, once you've created the container, it becomes safe for people to explore. And we've spoken about experimenting quite a bit already this morning. But then the other key thing is, where are we now? Where is their life already? Where are things already emerging within this um, you know, container I've created? And 
what is possible from here. And what is possible from here is not only responding to what you're already seeing, it's not only adapting. It is what are some of the untapped potentials that exists in this space that we can explore. And so responding is about seeding the space. And so we seed the future. We are trying to explore more broadly. We run multiple experiments at the same time. We amplify or dampen patterns. You know, if we create a pattern that's not beneficial, we dampen it. If something seems to have, you know, if there's potential there, we amplify it. We remove constraints to flow. One of my favorite new thinkers is Robert Chia. Um, he's a process philosopher at a university um, in the UK. And he talks about um, managing change by letting it happen. Change is already always happening. How do you remove constraints for the change that you want to see? How do you remove the barriers? And then safe to fail explorations. You know, we've mentioned, I, th I think, um, one of the earlier speakers spoke about, you need to be able to reverse any decision. So if you can reverse a decision, then it's safe to fail. If it's small enough, it's safe to fail. So how do we run more safe to fail experiments? And then finally, we need feedback. Because we don't know if our, somebody, people call this Sonia's pie slice. If we don't get feedback from the external environment, we don't know if our direction is still valid if where we think we are is still valid, or if that's changed as well. And if these limits, are they still limits? Or has something changed? So now all of a sudden something new has become possible. And do we still want to keep that other boundary in the same place? So we need feedback and we need diverse feedback. You know, this is one of the things that for me is really important in complexities. I think it can completely reframe how we think and talk about diversity and transformation. You know, especially South Africa, we've made it a problem to solve. And I believe it's a strategic asset to nurture. If we don't have enough diversity, we have no resilience. And so we need diversity of perspective. It's not a problem for us to solve. And so this is, I think it's my, my last slide, although you know, I was saying to, to the organizers, the worst thing you can tell me to do is send my slides two weeks before, because I'm still busy with them the day before. So now I can never remember where I am. Um, but this is a few years ago, I, um, I was sitting in traffic and I came across this billboard. At the time, I didn't particularly appreciate it. <laughs> but I think this is such a wonderful reminder for us because you know, yes, you might, you might not be able to do anything about your current physical position. You're stuck in traffic. You can choose how you're going to be stuck in traffic. Are you going to be cool? Or are you going to cause a road rage, rage incident? <laughs> and in the same way, all of the patterns we tend to complain about in our companies, we are part of those patterns. And if you are not stuck in a pattern, you are the pattern. It means that you've got agency even if you just take small local actions. And I think this is really my, my last slide, and it goes back to lightness, needing to look at the world differently. Lightness is one of the cool aspects that when I work in corporates, they say, this is the one that we need the most, but we can't have it. You know, here it's all about the numbers and we're all analytical and, you know, we're all chasing the targets and that's, we can't do that here. And um, so I want to end with this one this quote from Einstein, because this, I think, is one of the main invitations for us in complexity. And I'll read it to you. It says, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We've created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. We all intuitively know how to be in complexity but we need to remember the gift. And so I think that is it from me. I think I'm still within my time. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sonia. That was, as per normal, very good. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your time. All right, good, ladies and gentlemen. We're down to 